Well, last lecture we'd almost finished the <coughs> discussion on metal clouding, with the exception of the treatments for removing excess metal. I had mentioned that <coughs> potassium ferrocyanide was the ideal <coughs> treatment, but unfortunately uh, not permitted in this country. There are a number of other chemicals that can be used. For example, sodium sulfide works fairly well. <coughs> for removing copper. The only drawback to it is that it <coughs> its use frequently results in the production of hydrogen sulfide, which of course is highly undesirable. Rubianic acid. has been proposed as a treatment for <coughs> copper removal. It's a very effective agent, but it's quite costly and there's practically no data, there are practically no data on its toxicity. <coughs> this was proposed a number of years ago, but was not followed up because another <coughs> compound, which I'll discuss later, Pass that straight back, please. Was developed and has been used ever since. <clears throat> what is, is used in the United States legally as approval of the BATF and also the FDA? Does everyone know what BATF stands for? Tobacco and firearms. It had another name before and another name before that <clears throat> to change the name periodically and keeps everyone confused. Now it's the regulatory body charged by <clears throat> Congress to regulate the alcoholic beverage industries in this country. And of course the FDA is the Food and Drug Administration. A number of years ago, well, let's see, 15, 17 years, something like that. <clears throat> What at that time was Fester Laboratories, since Scott Laboratories, developed a material they called QFEX, C-U-F-E-X. And this was thoroughly tested by the BATF, by the FDA, also tested here by our department and controlled findings in the industry, and we found that if properly used that it would not leave any hydrogen cyanide in the wine because it was compounded and the compound included a scavenging agent so that if there was some hydrogen cyanide liberated, the scavenging agent would react with it and remove it. So it is finally approved for use and has been widely used ever since. It's legal to use it and it's very effective in removing copper and iron. It has one advantage over potassium ferrocyanide. It will remove copper preferentially. In other words, it removes copper largely before it removes iron. And nowadays, if we do have any metal problems, it's usually copper rather than iron. To use it requires the certain analyses, <clears throat> the submission of a report to the BATF, or to the food and, I'm sorry, to the state uh, equivalent of the, of the Federal Food and Drug. And it's also necessary, as we found by experience, that we do not remove all the metal. As long as we have one part per million of metal left in the wine, there's no danger of 
free cyanide remaining in the wine. If we try to remove all of the metal, if we get down below one part per million, then even with this agent, this <coughs> fine agent with the scavenging compound in it, there will be some cyanide left in the wine. Well, to sum up, the copper content should preferentially be below one-tenth to two-tenths parts per million. Zero is preferred by a number of winemakers. The iron content should be below five parts per million, though quite often the winemakers are not bothered with iron contents up to ten parts per million. And citric acid is usually effective insurance against iron clouding. Now, if there are no questions on the metal removal, we'll go on to fining. Well, there are a number of methods of <coughs> clarifying and stabilizing wines, and fining is only one of them. These include natural sedimentation, in other words, allowing the material to fall to the bottom of the tank and then racking off to separate the clear wine from the lees, <coughs> fining, filtration, centrifugation, and of course, <coughs> chilling and heating. Now, fanning may be defined as <coughs> the addition of substances which you react to the wine constituents to reduce the amount of the constituent that, that is originally present. In other words, we add materials to the wine to reduce constituents in the wine to the desired point. So fine is the reaction of added substances with substances in the wine to reduce the substance in the wine to the desired level. If you'll look at your <coughs> lecture outline, You'll see that the purpose of fining is five or fourfold, rather. We can find to affect a rapid clearing of the wine. Quite often, we want to get a young wine in the market quickly. We don't want to wait for the natural clarification, so we'll find to clear the wine quickly. We also find to clear wines that won't clear naturally and also to remove substances that <clears throat> we feel would either contribute later on to stability problems or <clears throat> would have un other undesirable effects. And we also find to affect changes in sensory properties. A good example is to reduce the stringency in red wines. Now there's some <clears throat> several considerations in the choice of a fine agent. Number one, what effect do you want to achieve? What's the specific thing that you want to accomplish? That should be the number one consideration in choosing a fining agent. Of almost equal importance is the effect on the sensory properties and also the effect on the ultimate stability. We can find and confer a temporary stability on a wine. We're looking for an ultimate stability. We also must keep in mind if we have our choice of several fine agents, any one of which can do the job, which one is going to produce the least lees? Because the lees mean loss of saleable wine. And of course, of least importance is the cost of the fining material. I'd like to devote a minute or two to discussion of the <clears throat> principles of artificial clarification. In other words, not natural sedimentation. And there are three principles <clears throat> that I like to emphasize. 
And the most important of these is do not use more processes than absolutely necessary. In other words, do the least to the wine that you possibly can. Do not use more processes than <clears throat> are required. Two, use minimum quantities. With betonite, it's impossible to overfine. But the more betonite that you use, the more you're going to take out of the wine and the more leaves you're going to have. <clears throat> so use the least amount of the fine material that will accomplish the desired result. And if you're subjecting the wine to various processing, for example, heating, then use the least processing temperature that will achieve the desired result. And also the time that you are subjecting the wine to the processing, make it as short as possible. So use minimum times and processing parameters. And number three, and this is the most important commandment of them all, regard every wine as an individual. Regard every wine as an individual. Don't develop routine finding practices for a given class of wines. It's the easy way to do it. It will probably achieve the stability that you are looking for, but you can do damage to the wine you can increase your cost of operation, and you can increase wine losses by routinely using a certain amount of fighting agent for a certain class of wine. In other words, regard every wine as an individual. Do the necessary work in the laboratory to determine the optimum fighting agent and the optimum fighting amount. And that is the most important thing for you to remember about artificial clarification. Even though it means lab work, the work you do in the lab is the least costly part of finishing a wine. When you get out in the plant, that's what it really costs, both in wine loss and in the cost of the operation and in the possible damage that you could do to the quality of the wine. Now, I like to say a few words about natural sedimentation because until the advent of fine agents, natural sedimentation followed by racking is the only method we had for clearing wines and for stabilizing wines. And here are a few observations on factors governing the ability of a wine to clarify itself. Number one is that sound wines will usually clear of their own accord. And unsound wines don't. In other words, if you make wines from unbalanced grapes, if your fermentation has been contaminated with bacteria, or if the bacteria has contaminated the wine shortly after the end of the fermentation, if you subjected wines to hot fermentations, all these will contribute to the lack of ability of the wine to clarify itself. So a sound wine, properly balanced, will usually clear itself naturally. Another thing is red wines usually clear better than white. And one would expect that because in red wines you have tannins. You don't have the protein problem because the tannins will get rid of the protein nicely. Whereas in whites, you have very little means of getting rid of protein. So red wines are usually clear better than whites. And high acid and high tannin wines will clear better than low acid and low tannin. So the higher the acid, the higher the tannin content, generally they will clear better than the wines that have low acid and low tannin. Do you know why that is? Well, in the case of whites, <clears throat> again, I'm referring to the protein. The lower the... Uh, <clears throat> pH, the higher the acid, the more protein is nasty precipitated. And of course, the higher the tannin content, the more protein is nasty precipitated. Now, as to classes of wines, uh, the naturally sweet and the high sugar dessert wines 
will clear less readily than dry and low sugar dessert wines. So if you have table wines containing a fair amount of sugar, you should not expect them to clear as rapidly as those that are completely dry. But unfortunately, under even the best mm. conditions, the wines seldom become brilliantly clear of their own accord. And that's why we must use artificial means of achieving clarity and achieving the stability we're, that we're looking for. Now, the theory of clarification as clarification as defined by fining is that the substance that you add may react chemically may neutralize charge or may dehydrate Any one or all three of these reactions are possible, depend upon the fine agent that is selected. After the fine agent is added, throw the mix into the wine, and the reaction occurs. You will get agglomeration, formation of particles large enough with the finest success to allow them to precipitate by gravity. And in falling through the wine, they will also mechanically remove suspended particles because you can visualize these particles falling through the wine as a type of fish net, passing down through the wine and attracting particles and carrying them down with them. Now the materials to be removed. <clears throat> In new wines <clears throat> before the first racking, you can classify the, sus the suspended solids into three groups. <clears throat> and by <clears throat> micrometer size. 7 tenths to 2.1, 2.1 to 6.2, and <laughs> over 6.2. And the first two groups are the predominant ones in new wines. Now, with normal racking, The particles that remain in the wine will usually fall naturally into three groups. 0.13 to 1.3, 1.3 to 4.2, and <clears throat> over 4.2. Well, in the new wines before they're racked, you have these three groups of particles according to size. After you've racked, then the particles that remain from the, in the wine from the racking will fall into these three classifications by size. I'm giving that to you to give you some idea as to what you're facing in removing these particles. And most of the particles after the racking fall into the last two groups with very few on that very, very fine particle size. Now the stability that's in the wine and the new wine may be due to <clears throat> one of several things. You may have coarse suspensions of grape tissue particles, in other words, particles of pulp or even particles of skin. Of course, you can have suspensions of yeast and possibly bacteria. So 
So you have your tissue particles, you have suspensions of yeast, and <clears throat> you can also have particles derived from the grape that are small enough to be classified as colloids. And the colloidal <clears throat> dispersed matter consists of several classes of substances. Proteins, of course. Pectins. Gums. And of course, in honor of the term guns, gums, excuse me, any related hemicelluloses. <clears throat> you can have glucosan from yeast. You can have <coughs> metallocolloids, other words, either metals or metals come by other materials, but in small enough particles that they are in colloidal form. You can have the degradation products of polyphenols. and a number of other things. Those are the main substances that you'll find as colloidal dispersed material in the wine. And those are the substances ordinarily that you want to reduce to a low enough level that they're not going to pose any problem for you later on. Any questions at this point? Well, the fact is affecting finding if you'll look at your lecture outline or seven, these seven main ones. First, electric charge on the finding agent, the pH of the wine, metals, temperature at which the wine is, uh, or, or at which the finding is conducted, the previous treatment of the wine, what's been done to the wine up until the time that you start to find it, the amount of the fine age that you use, and the type of wine. Now I'm going to use a certain format in discussing the various finding agents. And that format is also given in your lecture outline. First I'm going to discuss what it is the fine age and what it is. Secondly, how it reacts. Third, the factors affecting its action. When it should be used, how it's prepared for use, and the amounts used. Now we have quite a arsenal to choose from when we start finding wines. We can use tannin, gelatin, casein, isinglass, egg albumin, fresh egg white, frozen egg white, bentonite, peptic enzymes, carbon, metal removal materials, and PVP, or rather PVPP, polyvinyl polypyrrolidone, rather than polyvinyl pyrrolidone. Pardon? Well, Just got it on. Polyvinyl polypyrrolidone is really the correct term when most people say PVP, which is polyvinyl pyrrolidone. Can you read my handwriting? I sometimes have to read it myself. No, it's P O L Y V I N Y L P O L Y P Y R R O L I D O N E.
Oh, <clears throat> and I'll add one more. After PVP, nylon. Nylon has been pro properly activated. And there are not a large number of other things. A uh, number of years ago, I was asked to address a, a uh, club on some of the uh, ancient practices of winemaking. So I went to the library, got the rare books section, and it was really quite uh, educational to go through some of the ancient practices. I remember one that was highly recommended back in about the 15th century was the use of uh, fresh cow dung. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very efficacious. I don't know what it's efficacious for, but it's highly recommended for use. But that's not used any longer, at least to my knowledge. <laughs> well, the first one of these <clears throat> I'll discuss is tannin. <clears throat> And you can see from your lecture outline that there are two kinds that are used, at least in some countries in the world. And that is grapeseed tannin, in other words, the tannin extracted from grape seeds, and the natural grapeseed tannin, and the USP tannic acid. And the USP tannic acid bears no resemblance whatsoever to the natural grape tannin. It's, it's pentagallolil <coughs> uh, glucose. Whereas the natural grape tannin is very similar to the pigments in their uh, structure. What's the difference in cost? The uh, natural grapeseed tannin is considerably more costly than the uh, USP tannic acid. Unfortunately, in this country, we are forbidden to use grapeseed tannin. Why? Well, it's a long story, but it only takes a few words to tell it. <clears throat> After repeal in the 30s, the average customer for wine <clears throat> regarded a white wine, which was quite brown, as being an old wine. So since caramel was <clears throat> banned from use, color wines without paying a rectification tax, which was prohibitively expensive, grapeseed tannin was added, and that browned the wine beautifully. But according to the regulatory authorities, this was deceiving the customer, making him believe he was buying an old wine when he was actually buying a new wine. So they banned the use of grapeseed tannin. It's been banned ever since. Grapeseed tannin is really a much superior to the USP tannic acid, both in its fining action and also in its <clears throat> aid to inhibit oxidation, whereas <clears throat> USP tannic acid often will increase browning in a white wine rather than to decrease it, whereas grapeseed tannin invariably will decrease browning. Pardon? It decreases browning? Grapeseed tannin decreases browning in wine. They used to use it to brown wine? No, to just impart a brown color, because the grapeseed tannin itself was quite colored, since it was an impure tannin. Uh, Only around about 55 to 60 percent measured as tannic acid. And of course, tannic acid is a pure tannin and is the standard for measuring the tannin content of a number of materials though we prefer to use catechin as a standard in measuring the tannin content of uh, wines and grapes. How does it react? <clears throat> Principally with proteins. You can have hydrogen bonding between the hydroxyl of the phenol and the CO of the uh, protein. Of course, the CO, I should say, <clears throat> of the peptide chain of the protein. And the factors affecting this action, same as for gelatin. I'll go into detail on the factors affecting gelatin in the next finding aids discussion. 
that's prepared for use by just dissolving it in the wine. And you generally add about half as much tannin on a weight basis as you will gelatin or the, most of the other organic fine agents. Whereas the principal use of tannin is when one is adding organic fine agents because the white wines to which the organic fine agents are usually added are deficient in tannin and the organic fine agents require tannin with the exception of casing of course to react with. So you add tannin prior to the time that you add the organic fine agent. Gelatin. It's a collagen, <coughs> which of course is a sub-member of the albuminoid uh, proteins. It's found in skins, tendons, and bones, and it's extracted by treating with warm or hot water. It's one of the ways of doing it. And then it's converted into a soluble, water-soluble protein by boiling with water. Somewhat the same type of gelatin that's used in cooking it is also used for fining. Though we like to get as pure a gelatin as possible when we add it to wine to avoid imparting any off odors. Now how it re or factors affect no, excuse me, how it reacts. Well the gelatin micelles are positively charged. And the haze particles in the wine are usually negatively charged. So the positively charged gelatin particles will react with the negatively charged wine particles, haze particles you want to remove. And on neutralizing the charge, they come together and you get a rapid precipitation. Now, some of the things that affect its action. There are quite a few things. <clears throat> Temperature, pH, metals, aeration, dextran, previous treatment, amount of gelatin added, method of addition all affected. Now usually lowering the temperature below 25 degrees centigrade will aid in the clarification action. But not to get it too low, somewhere between 16 to 25 degrees centigrade seems to be about the optimum temperature range for the clarification of gelatin. And the higher acid and the lower pH, within limits of course, and that applies to practically everything we say about clarification, within limits, also aids. And by limits, <clears throat> example, usually if a wine is 2.8 to 2.9, you won't get a clarification. But if you raise the pH up to 3.2, no problem. So we'd say that generally around 3.2, 3.1 is about as low as you would want to go for a gelatin clarification. Now, iron is required, but we require the ferric form. The ferrous form does not work. So you must have, have had some aeration of the wine to have some ferric iron present to make the gelatin clarification work. Next trends. have a desired effect. <laughs> we 
because they can act as protective colloids. Of course, the dextrins, as I'm sure you all know, are polysaccharides. In wines, they're rather mucilaginous, or it's a mucilaginous material. Never did know how that's pronounced. But they can really be a problem in wines because they can activate as protective colloids and to prevent the gelatin clarification. Previous treatment of the wine. If the wine has been previously heated, it's quite possible that some protective colloids have been formed. So you need to know the previous treatment of your wine, the previous history of your wine, before you start to find it. Another thing, this is a danger with all organic fine agents, particularly so with gelatin and some of the other organic fine agents, and that's the danger of overfining. If you add too much gelatin, or the amount of tannin and other materials that are present that will react with gelatin, then you will <coughs> confer on the haze particles a positive charge, and you'll get a stable colloid or colloidal cloud formation. Whereas all the particles in there will be the same charge, they won't be neutralizing each other, and you'll look achieve a stable colloidal cloud which can be very, very difficult to remove. So that's another reason for working in the lab and determining the optimum amount of these organic fine agents to add because you don't want to overfine and greatly increase your problems. And the higher the temperature, at which you're finding the greater the danger of overfining with these organic fine agents. And if you do overfine, you're not going to break that cloud by adding more gelatin or any other, any other organic fine agent. There's only one way of doing it, and that's to add bentonite. I recall my, I think my second year as a wine chemist. owner of a very small winery came to me and <clears throat> said he had a wine that wouldn't clear. This is a white wine. He brought over a fifth bottle of it. I looked at it and he couldn't even begin to see through it. Horrible, horrible cloud. So I asked him what he had done to the wine. Well, someone had told him that he should find his white wine with gelatin. I said, well, that's all right if it's used within limits. I said, uh, how much you use? Well, he said, the fellow told me to use a pound or two pounds of a thousand. He said, I thought if a pound or two was good, why 15 to 20 would be better. So he put in 15 to 20 pounds. And that was the worst case of overfine I've ever seen in my life. I finally broke the cloud by adding bentonite. I think I used something like 60 or 70 pounds of bentonite per thousand gallons. And you end up with about a third of a tank of lees. <laughs> Well, gelatin is added primarily to reduce astringency in red wines. I've been talking about whites, and gelatin is used in uh, clarifying whites, uh, generally in connection with bentonite. But its primary use is to reduce the astringency in red wines. And how it's prepared for use? Dissolve in water at 35 degrees centigrade, and you can make up to a 6 to 10 percent solution of you need warm water to get it to dissolve readily, but you don't want the water to be too warm because if you get the water too warm, then you're going to start denaturing the gelatin and it'll lose all its fining power. So that's why 35 degrees centigrade is recommended. And if you're going to use on white wines, they require anywhere from an eighth to a pound per thousand gallons, and red wines from a quarter to about two and a half pounds. That's fairly common ranges of usage. Any questions on gelatin before we go on to the next one? Okay, casein, the principal protein of milk. And it's prepared for milk by precipitating with acid. Since it's insoluble in acid and insoluble in water, but it's soluble in alkali. 
So you can buy two forms of casing. You can buy the water insoluble form or you can buy the water soluble form. And you make the water soluble form by treating with alkali, with sodium hydroxide, for example, to form the sodium casinate, which is water soluble. And how it reacts, it's coagulated by the acids of wine. I might say if you do buy the water insoluble form, you can make it water soluble by adding ammonia, get it in solution, and then heating the solution to drive off the excess ammonia. And of course, like gelatin, in addition to <coughs> The mechanical carrying down of particles, <clears throat> you get mutual flocculation and precipitation <coughs> with the brown material that's present. And of course, also with the tannins. Since any of these organic fine agents will react with tannin. Now, the factors affecting this action the concentration of the casein solution. The method of addition of the casein solution, the amount of tannin in the wine, the temperature of the wine, previous treatment of the wine, as far as the concentration of the solution is concerned, 2% maximum solution of casein. What happens if you over casein? If you over casein, then you have the same problem as you if you over gelatin. Except that you're not nearly as apt to over casein fine as you are gelatin fine because the fact that casein does react with acids as well as with uh, polyphenolic material. <clears throat> the addition of tannin prior to the adding of the casein helps the clarification. As far as temperature is concerned, mm -hmm. the ordinary cellar temperature, say 65 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, is best. And again, like gelatin, if you get high temperatures, it's going to hinder the clarification. And again, like gelatin, if you're working with wines which have been previously heated, you're apt to have difficulty with the clarification because of the formation of protective colloids by the heating action. Its primary use is to remove color in white wines. In other words, if you have white wines that have acquired a brown tinge or even more of a brown color that you don't want, casein is pretty effective in removing this brown tinge or color. And how it's prepared, <clears throat> soak it overnight in water containing sulfur dioxide. And the old-fashioned way to prepare it was after soaking overnight in water was to rub it through a screen and stir it until it became thoroughly dissolved. Rubbing through the skin is a, or through the screen is a good way to lose the skin on your knuckles. And after it's been thoroughly dissolved, then dilute with wine to about a 1% strength. Of course, the easy way to make it up now is to use a wearing blender. But you must take care not to blend to the point where you're going to uh, denature the casein. In other words, get your solution too hot. An amount that's used anywhere from a half to three pounds per thousand gallons. You're not nearly as apt to overfine with casein as you are with gelatin because the casein can react with acids as well as with tannins, whereas the gelatin reacts only with the tannins. And the casein is quite effective in removing unwanted brown colors from white wines. Any questions on casein before I go on to the next one? What? Make it up to a 1% casein solution in wine after you've got it dissolved in the water. The brown color the casein removes, is that from oxidation or can it be from Right, and it's, <clears throat> the substrate for the brown color is almost always polyphenolic in origin, so it's understandable why the casein will, uh, is quite effective in removing it. How much acid can it remove? You don't add enough to even effectively diminish the acid. I never made a titration, so I can't tell you. But you can.
can't tell the difference by taste anyway. The rising glass is the next one. That's a protein made from the bladder of the sturgeon. It also reacts to tannin, and you get some mutual flocculation in addition to the mechanical actions you do with gelatin and casein. And the things that affect its <clears throat> action are, again, like gelatin and casein, the method of addition, the amount of tannins present in the wine, and the previous treatment of the wine, the presence of iron, and so on. Now, Ising glass is practically unique as far as an organic find is, is concerned, is that quite often you can use it on white wines without the necessity of adding tannin prior to the addition of the Ising glass, because the Ising glass requires the least amount of tannin for reaction of any of the organic fine agents. And its primary use is in fine wines, in other words, top quality wines, to achieve brilliance prior to boiling, where you do not want to subject the wines to filtration, because the filtration itself can sometimes remove unwanted substances. And also there's always the ever-present danger of aeration when one filters. So it was standard practice for many, many years in Europe and in California in the early days of the wine industry here, when filtration is rather primitive to use icing glass in place of a polished filtration just prior to Bali. And one of our most respected winemakers who has since retired, George Dewar, formerly of England Vineyards, who was a winemaker there for, I guess, 25 years, never filtered, he always used icing glass to clarify his wines, get them bright for Bali. And he put out some of the most beautiful wines I've ever had the pleasure of drinking. So Ising glass is unique in this respect, that it can be used in place of a polished filtration, where one does not want to subject his wines to filtration. And the amount of lees that are formed are very small, so there's not very much loss from lees from the use of Ising glass. And it's prepared by soaking overnight in water contains sulfur dioxide. Why do we add the sulfur dioxide, by the way? Keep the water from going bad. And to prevent any, well, keep the water from going bad, prevent uh, <clears throat> microbial action. And... Pardon? If you heat the wine before you put it in, or if it's, well, it's only used on hot, fine you don't have to worry about it. Right. Anytime you heat a wine and want to find with an organic fine agent or even with an inorganic fine agent, uh, you must take that into account. And there are certain tests that you can run to determine whether you have a sufficient amount of protective colloids formed by heating to pose a problem on a clarification. And that's something I'll go into later on. Does this also occur with the heated must? Yes. It does. Well, you rub it through a screen and stir or use a wearing blender, which is the easy way of doing it. And the amount that's used is very small compared with the others, from one-eighth to a third pound per thousand gallons, because it's a very effective fine agent for imparting a sparkle to the wine, a brilliance to the wine. I have the slightest idea what it is now, but it's always been the most expensive of any of the fine agents. And I imagine the price now is astronomical, and I doubt very much if you'd be able to buy it. So why am I talking about it? Increase well, your knowledge. <laughs> Plus, we develop a uh, <clears throat> Ising glass industry here based on the sturgeon in the Sacramento River. Some of the wineries are seriously considering uh, going back to the use of Ising glass for. Uh, polishing their wines prior to filtering. Uh, it may still be available in commercial quantities, it may not, I, I couldn't tell you. But the sturgeon population in Russia has been falling rather drastically due to uh, contamination of the, uh, of the uh, waters in which the sturgeons live, because I know they're ex 
port of uh, caviar has fallen. So I imagine that the availability of Isinglass has also uh, decreased. I'll tell you this wine business is complicated. I have to worry about sturgeon and Russia. Okay, that's it. <laughs>